Ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is uh, Fu Hua Lin. I'm uh, from the Faculty of Law of this uh, university. Um, we, we are truly delighted to have uh, a panel of experts on media law and uh, policy from mainland China to come to um, Hong Kong to attend this um, uh, conference. Um, we know that uh, the, the winter is very cold in Beijing at this moment. Um, at least the, the, the weather is warm here. So, uh, um, I'm not sure whether China actually has media law, but we do have uh, excellent media lawyers. So, on the stage, we, we have uh, five uh, top notch media lawyers. I don't know what to do, but uh, they, they teach, they research, they critique, and um, they, um, uh, um, they play a very uh, instrumental uh, role in promoting the development of a, a media law in the People's Republic. Um, yeah. Yeah. The five speakers will talk about uh, the different aspects of media law in China or the emerging potential of media law in China, focusing on basically two things. One is defamation, another is uh, uh, internet governance. Uh, I think two of them are related, judging by their uh, the articles they have um, published. Um, the first speaker is uh, Professor uh, Xu Xun. Uh, she is the Executive uh, Director Research Center for Media Law, uh, China University of Political Science and Law. Uh, she is going to provide an overview of um, the defamation law in China. Uh, Yuqin, Xu Lao Si. Uh, Professor Fu for the introduction. Well, before the conference, I have submitted a paper in this booklet at the reception desk. You can find it. And my paper is um, on page 3 to page 10. In China, defamation law has not become official yet. When we mention about defamation law, um, we are talking about certain articles within our civil law, our constitution, and our criminal law related to defamation act. Well, although the situation is far away from ideal, however, the rapid development in defamation law area, actually we have gone a long way only in 30 years compared to what other countries have come uh, from the past few hundreds of years. Of course, we are faced with similar problems as other countries. And I think defamation law development in China has basically experienced two stages. The second stage started in 2011, which shows that our development in defamation law has entered a deep water area. How do we manage the expression of the media and the public, manage their expression of their opinions. Uh, at the moment, there is not much uh, agreement. And Chinese civil law with regard to defamation has not enjoyed a great development, which has provided room for the development for the defamation law area within the Constitution and the um, criminal law. What you can see from the first stage, 1979 to 2001, we have established a basic form of defamation law concept. 
this is during this period there has not been much disagreement uh, with regard to defamation law concept. It started from zero. And in my paper in this booklet, I basically talk mainly focused on the second stage of development uh, since the beginning of the century. Since early of this century, the aspect of definition um, with regard to civil law, there has not been much development, so it cannot adapt to the new changes going on. And um, page five, you can see there is a chart. And in this chart, you can find a timeline. On the left part of this timeline, I talked about the advice given to legislation and the actual actions taken. What we observe is that there are many researches going on, many pieces of advice given, also as well as many controversy controversies. However, the actual legislation situation is not ideal for the media sector and the um, legal uh, law study center. What we have advised in our research were not adopted by the government, and this is one of the reasons that we have not um, actually enjoyed any sort of real development. Secondly, it would the development of the media, the government, what attitude does the government have with regard to the media reports? This has been a difficulty um, situation for China. And on the right side of the chart is the actual situation in China. You can see every year basically there is a representative case of what's going on that year the first one is um, in 1999 there were many government workers suing the media for um, destroying for defamation and this number is around um, 16 cases per year in 1999, which has actually come down until 2007. That was none. So you can see basically right now uh, the plaintiffs have given up on this. And um, then with the development, we can see there were many cases. Um, has entered into a stable period. Um, we have seen more people who have been detained to sue the government or sue certain agencies. Um, for example, in Chongqing, we have also seen um, many people suing. They have been detained illegally. Um, the third period is the Supreme Court's interpretation of Defamation Act. Of course, with the interpretation of both the Supreme People's Proce uh, Procurator and the Supreme People's Court, uh, these cases have not actually entered into the actual um, court procedures, so uh, we sh are still waiting to see what's going to happen. So for the past 10 years, under the supervision of the media for the government workers, um, the attitude is uh, that in the civil law cases, it is not developing. 
Um, however, we have enjoyed great development in the Constitution and in the criminal law area with regard to the Defamation Act. Of course, we um, believe in self-discipline if uh, the behaviors could be self-managed, we would not step in. And for Defamation Act, we believe that would be the final step to be taken by the government. But as it relates to the defamation law in China and the several characteristics that I have outlined, we uh, can but uh, come to a conclusion that uh, the criminal law and the civil legislation uh, is um, eating into each other uh, during that period. Uh, freedom and order is uh, conflicting each other. And of course, uh, civil law is not sufficient to govern this, especially when the government uh, think that it is not enough to maintain order, then it would leave a space for criminal law to advance. This, I believe, is uh, largely based on or caused by the fact that um, in China we do not have a conditions whereby we can um, eliminate uh, public um, justice or public trial based on uh, criminal law in defamation. And as to what time or when, when we can uh, do away with this, then we will start to have a hope to see the doing away of criminal offense for uh, defamation. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the um, very concise uh, survey of the historical development and uh, a very nice um, update on the um, recent development. Uh, um, her view is um, uh, China should use uh, civil law, not criminal law, private law, not public law, and rely on self-regulation, uh, not external regulation when it comes to uh, uh, internet governance and um, uh, defamation. Our second uh, speaker uh, is Professor Chen Xinxin. He came from the Law Institute of China Academy of Social Sciences. It's the topic of his presentation is the uh, classification of content in the internet and the corresponding uh, governance and control. Uh, Chen Master. We invite Mr. Uh, Professor Chen. Thank you. I first of all like to express my delight to be able to uh, participate in this seminar and to share with you some of my views on these topics. And the I like to share with you about uh, within an internet uh, environment the uh, classification of information and its management. Now, according to the uh, jurisprudence classification in mainland China. Its media law covers uh, all the operating and behavior of all media, especially its uh, behavior as far as the um, communication of information is concerned. So the topic that I will uh, cover actually belongs to the um, media law um, subject you know, under mainland law systems. Now, actually, as it relates to um, classification and management, as a legislator, the first concern or first uh, thing that we, they would think about is um, the mechanism for uh, this uh, legal structure uh, would should be about the subject matter, the object matter, and the, the, the channel, the way of regulating. Now, that's what we would usually refer to as a legal subject matter. Um, and that, and the content actually decides uh, what type of mechanism would be used and what type of standard would be applied. Now, uh, in the internet world, Not only uh, the subject matter is under scrutiny, but also the entire development and technology of the internet. 
So, and it is only with this comprehensive view that um, how this internet is to be governed and managed can be decided. Otherwise, it would be very easy for the officials to um, to be influenced by fallacies uh, of uh, previous um, uh, generations, and that could actually cause very inappropriate effects. Now, regardless whether it is developed country, uh, Western country, or uh, developing countries or Eastern countries, uh, national security and public interest related uh, information and its legal structure, I guess the object objective is relatively similar and the means of regulating are somewhat similar too. However, the difference is that with um, specific content, what is, you know, the, the level of uh, flexibility and, you know, would be different, especially as it relates to public content. This is very often the differences in legal structure and legal uh, interpretation of different countries. And for, therefore, the classification of information is mainly in accordance with uh, national security, uh, social ethics, and social values, as well as uh, legal entities, you know, the protection of the rights of legal entities. Now, these would be the factors uh, that would be considered when classifying uh, various information. Now, under the law, uh, information safety and its management is something that everyone, uh, not only the state, has to participate in. It is not something that can be achieved solely by the state itself. So, uh, in this on this front, we must look into both um, the advantages and uh, shortcomings of both the state institution as well as the individual you know, when they play this role in order to determine who has more res responsibilities. So uh, when protecting public interest and national interest, maybe the state has a better advantage and therefore more responsibilities. However, in the protection of uh, private rights and legal entities, um, these entities would probably have a more uh, have, have a better advantage over the state. So these individuals would definitely, you know, have more responsibilities when, uh, you know, in terms of maintaining, you know, such an order. For example, uh, when, you know, things like uh, commercial secrets, um, uh, privacy, and uh, defamation of uh, individual persons, you know, this is not something that the government can control. It is rather, um, it should, you know, better be managed or guided by uh, private law governing the behavior of individuals and legal entities. And it is not something that sh um, is uh, appropriate to go for a public law um, interpretation. Now, under such a context, now I would now classify you know, information into these categories. First is government data, which are further divided into two groups. One is in accordance, uh, you know, what one is the confidential information, and the second group would be open, you know, information that can have open access to people. Now, it is very likely that those uh, institutions that um, have access to these confidential information would then have the responsibility to protect this. So the law says that who holds or who has access to these information would therefore have the responsibility of protecting this information. And those who does not have access or uh, who does not hold the information should not be um, uh, should not have the burden of the responsibility. This is uh, a very um, uh, prominent 
way of thinking along the line of Chinese law. Therefore, the Internet only plays a role in the transfer of information. And it is an Internet only plays a role when confidential information gets uh, transferred through the Internet. So for those so it is perfectly uh, uh, practical to you know um, use this classification way to uh, tackle the problem of uh, leaking confidential information. And we can just rely on you know uh, safety uh, um, you know on the, uh, the in the identification as to who has control and who has access to those information. Now, the second uh, subgroup is public information, largely referring to those information that may have an impact on public interest. Now, I would classify these further into such subgroups. First is those public information that has an impact on public security and national security, and these impacts are evident and immediate. And this, for this type of information, the government has the um, power to take immediate actions to keep this, uh, this type of information from being uh, transmitted within the society. And they they can they should be able to take um, inter, uh, immediate actions to stop such transferring, and also to mitigate the negative results uh, caused by such um, transfer. And therefore, you may see that for some countries and jurisdictions, uh, its focus would uh, is not on prevent uh, prevention of the um, the transfer of these harmful information. Uh, rather, uh, the focus is on penalty of those that has infringed. Now, as we can see, uh, in uh, penalty is post-event. Uh, it is not uh, protective, and it is not preventive. And it also does not have any effect on imme immediate control of damage and um, and the minimization of damage. Therefore, we believe that we cannot rely too much on penalties. And rather, because penalty only has an impact on those crimes that has not yet been done, and it really can help very little about those crimes that has been already been done. Now, some countries' um, law make references to the Human Rights um, Convention. Uh, however, we believe that this classification is um, also in line with the Human Rights uh, Convention. Now, another category are those information that may be harmful to young people. Now, for this type of information, for many countries and jurisdictions, it allow, uh, the, the law allows for our preventive um, actions and of course, those preventive actions are subject to regulations uh, and on, uh, in order to ensure that um, uh, to ensure that um, uh, the the channels or the ways of exercising such control is in line with the law, and that there's no abuse of the good intent and another part, the third part is. Uh, for those information that has a um, has set damages on the society as a as a whole, uh, the f these would be these would be regulated through the uh, self-regulation of the media, and the state only plays a role of guiding and encouraging for uh, voluntary participation in self-guidance or self-regulating. Uh, 
and the government actually uh, does not have a strong hand into such regulation. Now, another case or situation is that for those uh, ISP or online providers uh, it, uh, to exercise um, uh, penalty on them. And another type would be to give the government the power or the um, uh, or the ability to uh, shut down on these infringing organizations. And the last one is is on those uh, directly connected uh, servers, uh, which is outside of the uh, internet, and that you know those regulation would be applying to these point-to-point um, uh, -point connections. Now these, uh, as far as I can understand, would be the classifications of those harmful information to individuals, legal entities, as well as, so as well as society and national security. Now as to the internet. Um, those information that harms uh, a private rights uh, because uh, its uh, subject matter uh, it relates to a private person. So we believe that uh, we should allow uh, the one who has been harmed the choice of um, various ways of uh, mediation or to mitigate harms or to, uh, to go into litigation, well, allowing these people to have um, the options um, of choosing a way to try to settle the matter. And this person who has harmed uh, should actually initiate the actions instead of having the state or the government play a major active role. So my personal view is uh, to support uh, the straight um, uh, prohibition of using public justice uh, in this area because it can actually cause uh, a huge waste of public resources and it also it is very easy for this type of um, public uh, justice um, to uh, cause the over-reliance on uh, the government or the institutions to seek remedy. And this is not uh, good for the development of the society. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. Um, the Next speaker is um, Professor Wang Sushim. He's um, uh, from the Faculty of Law, China Media University. He's going to talk about the internet governance. Uh, <coughs> I am delighted to participate in this meeting and have the opportunity um, to uh, help, you know, under the situation when uh, Professor Zhang Jiang is absent, to be able to share with you some of my views on the uh, development of, govern uh, of uh, internet governance. As you are aware, the Chinese government, as well as the two uh, judiciary uh, organizations, institutions in China, which is the Supreme People's uh, Pokru uh, Rhetorate, as well as the Supreme People's Court, you know, their joint interpretation on um, some in, uh, on some application of law in uh, media law, and this is with the intention to address some of the social issues that have been caused by the rise of the internet. For example, uh, libel on the internet or uh, um, uh, defamation to others' uh, name, as well as uh, privacy. Uh, over the internet, which has become more and more uh, common. And also that it is intended to uh, maintain order in the chaos, uh, in the chaotic um, um, uh, chaotic uh, environment of uh, expression in the internet. You know, these two supreme institutions uh, 
they also try to explain or provide guidance as to uh, some of the issues that may arise when application of this law. I am a teacher uh, in uh, who uh, in the uh, Communications University of China who has been studying on this front for a long, long time. So I would like to explore from the perspective of uh, freedom of speech and to uh, share with you some of the uh, issues with freedom of, of speech arising from the governance of the Internet. Well, from their final words on the governance of Internet, it has, stayed, it has been for a while. I think um, this has reflected one issue for judicial bodies if from the perspective of free speech for an independent judicial body from the jurisdiction point of view, it means that the government is controlling the speech. Well, the Supreme People's Court and Supreme People's Procultorate, it has shown that in China right now there is no independent judicial body uh, can shoulder this responsibility. And this is one of the problems that has been reviewed during this governance of Internet, which means that we need a more independent which means that we need a more independent uh, body to deal with this issue and to limit the government's power. Of course, their interpretation after their interpretation, if we read from the interpretation from the judicial bodies, we can see that we have used certain terminology, such as destroying the image of the country. We think that is a very vague concept, and it constitutes a large scale. Well, we are while undergoing judicial interpretation, it has taken a crime to that has only been in the physical world to online. I think this is also problematic, not only that the judicial bodies did not play their roles, but also in the meantime, when the government is carrying out its work, it has its empowerment has been limited. All of this has reflected when the government is drafting its legislation, especially those two supreme courts, it has shown that they lack basic consideration of free speech, which also shows that in our past practice, we did not consider the problem from such perspective. Therefore, we do not have enough judicial experience in this regard, especially when it comes to connecting with the rest of the world, there are certain problems that we face. This is also an aspect that we scholars have been promoting to the government. We 
think and we believe that we have been campaigning, um, we need to introduce a monitoring system of free speech. On one hand, we need to limit the government's control on free speech. On the other hand, we can accumulate more experience. We believe the system in the UK and in the USA is something that we should follow suit. Uh, on one hand, not only their system limits the power of the government, on the other hand, it is a good process for the judicial system in the UK and in the USA to accumulate experience. Of course, the interpretation from the Supreme People's Court and the Supreme People's Procuratorate, uh, uh, many people have talked about the issue of free speech. Well, in China, when you mention free of speech, if we imagine that this case happened in the UK or in the USA, well, it's similar to the ACLU versus Reno case mentioned by our colleague from the Philippines. However, such case is not possible to happen in China. But encouragingly, we have seen the government have been doing some adjustment. However, if civil society wants to seek some sort of self-protection, uh, if the ISP uh, or a personal individual think that their freedom of speech has been infringed, that is not possible in China. This is in China currently, even though in the Constitution it has said that civil citizens have the rights to freedoms of speech. However, it is only written in the Constitution, but it's not practiced in reality, because in China the Constitution cannot be quoted in the criminal procedure. So uh, thus in China we lack this mechanism to solve the problem of freedom of speech. And this is what I would like to share with you all today. Uh, thank you very, very much for this um, wonderful presentation. Uh, Professor um, Wang touched upon three important issues. First, the importance of independent court, the fact that China doesn't have independent court, and finally, the social and the political implications of that uh, sad absence. Um, the next speaker is um, uh, Professor Zheng Wenming. Um, he comes from the Capital University of uh, Econ uh, Economy and the Business. Um, his um, uh, presentation is on the reform of defamation law in China. Thank you, Professor Fu, for your introduction. I'm going to talk to you about some of my research on the uh, reforms of Defamation Act. And you can see on my PPT on the background is uh, the budding of trees in the spring. And what does that mean? That is very symbolic. That symbolizes 
the beginning of the reform of criminal defamation in China. Now, not many people are actually carrying out this work. Maybe some people are, but not in the name of criminal defamation. So perhaps my speech today is an opportunity for people to further their work. And uh, the defamation reform in China includes the criminal defamation and the civil defamation. I'm going to focus my speech on the criminal aspect of it. Well, first of all, concept. The concept of criminal defamation, it uh, refers to the law of um, defamation dealing with criminal offenses with regards to defamation. And uh, I have put it into two categories on the, in a wider sense, the criminal defamation refers to defamation to the head of state, um, government bodies, government workers, and um, national um, anthem and uh, national symbols. And this is normally what in the West you call a seditious. Uh, libel and uh, in the narrow sense it refers to the defamation of uh, individuals and just now Professor Xu has mentioned that we do not have specific defamation act uh, as what is about to enter into force in the UK in 2013 um, nor do we have the um, a uh, seditious act published in the USA in 1968. Um, again, I have summarized them into uh, five types of defamation um, offense. The first one is in the criminal act in the 103 um, to uh, to cause the um, to cause the country to become a part and uh, uh, 105 um, to cause damage to the country's uh, the government's uh, control of the, uh, of the state and uh, here I would like to talk about the 105 uh, article article 105 in section 2 uh, here it says that if um, you are using defamation or rumors uh, to cause damage to the countries uh, to the government's uh, government's management of the country, then you are liable for um, up to five years in the in prison. And um, the narrow sense of defamation act in Article 246 in our criminal act, and this is called the general defamation and if you are destroying the reputation of others you also face imprisonment now i would like to talk about the potential dangers of criminal defamation um, the aim is to protect national security public order and reputation of natural persons if we do not have a strict judicial procedure, it may cause um, abuse. Uh, Defamation Act may become uh, abused, become a abused tool by other people to um, to to carry out retaliation. And here is a list of cases happened between 2006 to 2010 in China. Here there are about 20 cases about uh, defamation against leaders, of local leaders. 
Well, there are, of course, certain other cases happened in Chongqing after 2010. I did not list it in my PPT, and here is one case uh, that has happened recently. Uh, Professor Xu mentioned about this yesterday. This is the first case uh, of defamation that was dealt with after the new interpretation of defamation was issued by the Supreme People's Court. Um, a 16-year-old uh, Mr. Yang, um, student Yang, uh, he has said online, uh, spread a rumor. And uh, here he was uh, detained um, for provocation. And in our criminal law, there were six kinds of uh, defamation. And here the Public Bureau has uh, initially said he was spreading rumor. Then he was given the offense title of um, provocation, which is wrong, really. and. Uh, in the end, he was uh, published, uh, pu punished lightly. And before, prior to the issuance of the new interpretation by the two courts, uh, two cases here. One is in Qinghe County in Hebei. Um, one netizen has issued online saying that, oh, there has been a murder case in Luzhuang, anyone who knows about the truth, and uh, because he has, uh, uh, in his uh, comment, he has uh, given the wrong number of the deaths, so he was also detained. Another case, uh, uh, 2013, August, in Anhui, uh, there was a major traffic accident. Um, which caused 10 people, 10 deaths and five people injured. And uh, however, he on his um, microblog, he said that 16 people have died in this um, accident. So he was also detained for spreading false information. Um, well, on the other hand, uh, defamation, criminal defamation is the largest threat to uh, the freedom of speech and uh, democratic um, poli uh, politics. Here is a simple chart. You can see uh, criminal defamation points to freedom of speech, which then affects the building of democracy, of the democratic uh, politics. Now, moving on simply to talk about how to reform the criminal defamation in China yesterday, um, and also the first half of this morning, many scholars talked about the reforms in their respective countries. But well, in China currently, we are I, we can only talk about it in theory. Uh, in mainland China, uh, four aspects I'd like to mention here. First, it needs to follow the uh, self-development rule of defamation law. Well, for defamation law, obviously, as the name suggests, it's there to protect the reputation of natural persons. Of course, in the meantime, there will be uh, conflicts with the freedom of speech. So how do we strike a balance between those two? Well, I think the overall trend is to provide to protect freedom of speech more and more. Uh, to give you a simple example, for in the UK, the 2013 Defamation Act, there were certain articles um, have been amended, and uh, uh, the amending trend is actually to protect more of freedom of speech. For Chinese reform, we should follow the uh, following rules. The first one, uh, 
its aim is only to protect the reputation of natural persons and certain legal persons, but not government bodies. Second, uh, we need to decriminalize uh, decriminalize uh, defamation, defamation. And thirdly, we need to have very strict judicial reviews of criminal defamation. Second, our reform must be positioned, must be in the context of the Chinese situation. And Chinese political environment or China's environment is very difficult to summarize. Uh, traditionally, uh, the power of the state is not to be controlled, not to be limited. Of course, this causes great threat to the country's, uh, to the citizens' freedom of speech, which is completely different from the West. And uh, in Chinese thousands of years of history, we have always um, put the government at the top, and they have the ultimate right. Um, thirdly, the decriminalization of defamation um, in mainland China at present, it is not realistic. So we need to do this gradually, of course. We need to combine this with the reform of civil defamation. Thirdly, we need to adapt to the development of Internet. It has to do with uh, data technology, and the reform of defamation law in China must go in line with uh, technological development, and we cannot go against the trends. This uh, talks about the difference between um, internet or cyber defamation with uh, standard, you know, traditional defamation, which I will not go into detail. Um, and in the age of internet, anything can happen, and uh, Chinese defamation law reform is um, necessary and timely. Thank you. I want you to hear more. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. Um, Thank you for, for making the intentional uh, effort to make the connection between freedom uh, uh, and the democracy, which I think is an important um, point to make. The final speaker uh, for this panel is uh, Professor uh, Zhu Wei. He is going to talk about the self-regulatory model in the internet governance. I have no PPT. Uh, I have no PPT, but I like to stand and present because it looks better on the pictures. <laughs> now, uh, because despite the fact that I teach in the uh, university, and well, we cannot do away with this time lag, I'm sorry. Uh, but as a teacher in university, you can also have other roles in the society. So. Um, I am also the uh, legal advisor for the uh, uh, Chinese Artists Association, um, you know, and I would work with them about protecting their um, uh, mod, uh, copyrights and uh, model releases, etc. Now, um, there are some areas that may, that have to do with uh, defamation, and I'm also a lawyer. You know, in mainland China, there are some very famous um, cases, uh, one of which uh, I'm working on because um, it has not been awarded yet, so I would, cannot go into detail talking about them. Now, the Chinese um, internet, there are some characteristics about them which I would like to share with you. First of all, uh, China does not have uh, a practice of using the constitution, to, in, you know, uh, referencing to the constitution, um, to or the statute to uh, make a legal award. Uh, this is something that is being criticized by many. Uh, several years ago, there was a, a netizen that actually 
you know, wrote some, who actually wrote something on the internet and then it was deleted. And then he filed a sue. Uh, he sued for um, infringing on his uh, freedom of speech um, based on the, uh, the, the Constitution. And his uh, request was rejected because the court says uh, we do not rely on the Constitution. And then there is also another case when the you know when a um, a website regarding uh, matchmaking actually deleted uh, this person's name on you know on uh, on the web. So uh, he or she filed uh, based on the reasons that uh, there's an infringement on his uh, freedom and it has stopped him or her from getting um, you know merit. And this request was also rejected. Now, how do we? You know, look at these. Uh, however, I am against uh, the saying that there is no media law in China. China does have a media law, but it you know appears in you know in in a different form, perhaps you know just the same as that uh, you can feel the breeze despite the fact that you cannot see the breeze. Now, uh, several years ago, I was still studying my doctoral degree in law. Uh, uh, Professor Yang Li Xin. I, you know, worked with him on a topic regarding uh, the EU. We have a large hope um, as to whether uh, we can, through the criminalization of civil law in China, to try to solve this issue. Now, after several years of hard work, and very thankful for uh, the um, one million uh, euros of sponsoring uh, from the EU. Now, we have already conducted or uh, completed. Uh, this guideline on uh, judicial uh, award uh, research. Now, in this guideline, we outlined uh, 22 defense on uh, press freedom. Uh, we outlined and analyzed them. Uh, for example, a public figure, uh, public interest, um, uh, fair comment, um, etc. You know, these are. You know, these are actually defense bases that appeared um, randomly in different cases. And we were able to uh, group and analyze them and form a basis for uh, a framework for protecting freedom of speech. Now, this is, you know, I wouldn't, would not say that China is backwards, you know, as far as this is concerned, but this is just the way that China is. Now, in this guideline, um, we have a chapter on uh, internet infringement. When we wrote this part, we referenced on uh, the legislation of over 30 countries in the world. And uh, we discovered that some of the uh, Chinese um, problems uh, actually did not appear in other countries. Because you know China has the biggest uh, netizen population and the fastest development um, internet uh, industry. Uh, Mr. Roger. Um, should know um, when we work on this um, uh, booklet or guideline, we actually had uh, you know many many meetings with EU professions and uh, professionals and experts. They also admitted that uh, China, you know, as far as um, you know internet issues and problems is concerned, we lead the world. Uh, we actually are you know crossing the river by um, you know we're, we're actually learning as we walk. Now, most of our websites were hosted in Beijing, uh, largely in the Haidian and uh, Chaoyang districts. Now, the, uh, the uh, courts in these two districts, um, they, uh, they would, uh, rely on our guideline when they um, process or uh, judge on defamation and infringement cases. And also, there are other courts that also used our guidelines. And also, the um, Youth Responsibility uh, Act uh, regarding cyber crimes, they also relied on our guideline. And there are also other institutions that are, uh, that are of provincial uh, status. Uh, they would also rely on our guidance. So I'd like to express our thanks to the EU once again for this um, great support. Our ideal is high. We thought that this guideline perhaps 
could not be completed within a short time and could not be widely applied uh, broadly in the uh, Chinese judiciary. So we wanted to, you know, to push it from bottom to top. You know, I have to talk to you about the Xinlang and uh, Weibo. You know, many of you uh, probably don't know about Weibo, just like you know, some many of the Chinese don't know about Twitter. You know, what I can tell you is that Weibo equals to uh, Twitter, and our QQ equals to your Facebook. Weibo. Uh, how many users are there? Uh, let me take an example. When Sino, uh, during that age, uh, the users is already f uh, 585 million people. So each day, these users, uh, they would comment on uh, the society, they would talk about societies and talk about other netizens. You know, with such a large population, how do you guide them, regulate them? You know, these network, you know, can they really delete those um, unwanted, you know, uh, either by uh, individuals or either by government, you know, the, you know, can they really delete those messages? Because internet uh, websites, they are a commercial uh, um, organization, you know, they should not be burdened with uh, judicial um, uh, responsibilities. So we were able to uh, put this guideline uh, into a pilot trial with uh, Xinlang and Weibo. So, and we actually had an agreement you know, with these two organizations, which um, we have uh, translated into English and attached to the uh, booklet that you have. Now, we, uh, def uh, we very clearly defined uh, the lines of freedom. Uh, which are not to be infringed or uh, breached, not only in China, but also in other worlds. Uh, such includes the rights of other people, uh, security of the nation, uh, health, and privacy, etc. So we were, uh, we tried to make a clear definition as to what these um, thresholds or guidelines are. And so when somebody, you know, issues uh, def uh, defamatory uh, messages in the internet, the more he does that, the, the less he becomes trustworthy and, you know, it is very likely that his name or his account would be, uh, would disappear ultimately. Um, this is uh, something probably quite different from, um, from uh, the European or other countries because um, other countries relies on case laws uh, to try to guide this. We have 5,500 uh, 5, um, judges, you know, cyber judges, you know, which we chose from that, you know, large amount of uh, netizens. And we also choose some um, senior judges from this uh, 5,500 ju uh, ordinary judges. You know, we call them judges. And and then in this trial, we also have a first trial and a second trial. So, so we at, at one point we were worried that the uh, country would would try to you know would not understand what we were trying to do, um, you know, and they would probably think that we are moving you know we are copying this um, entire system from the UK or from the. Uh, from the uh, um, from the West, you know, such as including uh, the jury or you know um, you know those uh, expert witness, you know you know those you know all these um, jargons and roles, you know that uh, are not familiar to China, the Chinese institutions. And on the net, we actually judged um, 130,000 cases of criminal of uh, of a cyber infringement. Now, this is uh, quite meaningful. Let me give you an example. Somebody reported that uh, there are people uh, uh, mocking on Hil uh, Hillary, saying that he, she has a lot of boyfriends. Now, at that time, we believe that we do not have to access Hillary or Clinton to, um, you know, to, to verify that, so we just deleted that message. Then, but we were not in agreement as to how do we um, go after the uh, defamator. Now, because uh, Hillary, you know, is the is the 
you know, the Hillary is the person who is being harmed, but she has not taken any action. It's just a fan of Hillary that has reported. So we decided that we would uh, we would cancel the account or cancel the um, the uh, defamators account, and we are also open, you know, to the idea of Hillary coming here to uh, make a uh, you know file a report and make a, uh, a case herself. So uh, lately, I also handed you know I also um, sued a defamation case. Um, we were the uh, plaintiff because uh, when we have to prove that such a uh, def defamation, we uh, actually spent over 30,000 uh, yuan on certifying, you know, these documents. You know, you know, law is for everybody, but can everyone afford such uh, afford such cost? You know, in Xinlang, in the website, I think this is a good uh, way because. Once you file a complaint, then there would be people who would vote, and there would be judges who would judge. And you know, if you are do not you know agree to the first uh, award, then you can uh, make an appeal at the second uh, uh, trial, and you know try to seek your justice. And that doesn't cost any money. Now this is. Uh, so we held the first uh, cyber, you know, conference. And of the uh, of all those that uh, participated, I learned that I was the only one who actually learned about law. So I was a bit concerned because um, you know freedom of speech and human rights is is, you know, is something uh, so uh, so secret that we have to be serious about it. So we talked to the EU, and uh, we were able to seek. Um, some sponsors, you know, in order to push forward our uh, program. Well, I only have one more minute. <laughs> so the uh, UK believes that um, there are not a lot of uh, freedom in the Chinese uh, internet already. Now, if you go again for this type of thing, then it would further limit the freedom. So we are still uh, applying, you know, we're still working hard on it. Now, what I like to summarize is that um, the Chinese internet is still developing, and uh, it is now being judicially interpreted. Uh, I mean, the uh, cyber law. And as to end of last year, uh, we are working on the protection of privacy. So, uh, Chinese media law and internet law are developing very quickly. You know, please do not only look at its past, you know, look at its future. You know, I do see a very bright future for a freer, more, indete more independent, um, you know, internet space in China. You know, try to learn a bit more and you can try and you know, apply to be uh, a judge on our uh, Sina uh, website, but of course you can only judge uh, English-speaking cases because it would be very hard for, for us to understand English. Thank you. Thank you very much. 500 million people is a huge country. I think you will be the chief justice of that particular <laughs> jurisdiction. Um, thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. Um, do we have? No, we don't have time. No, I'm sorry. Um, um, well. Why not we thank the speakers for the wonderful presentation. We could uh, mingle during lunch. Thank you. Thank you again.